Good morning. The first item of business is general questions. Question one has been withdrawn. Therefore, I call Jeremy Balfour at question two. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the right of disabled people to dedicated accessible spaces. Minister Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Our strategy, uh, Fairer Scotland for Disabled People, sets out a commitment to places that are accessible to everyone. Uh, and we are working with disabled people's organisations to develop our new strategy, listening to what barriers disabled people face and finding solutions. We have made significant progress in, in advancing disability equality in many areas, including delivering 1,124 homes for disabled people. Additionally, under the Equality Act 2010, public authorities, businesses and organisations are responsible for making reasonable adjustments to meet disabled people's needs, and we expect all rev relevant organisations to comply with the requirements of the Act. Jeremy Balfour. Can I thank the Minister for his answer? Active travel measures and new pedestrian areas can sometimes make the built environment less accessible for disabled people. If it leads to the removal of blue badge parking bays, unclear demarcation of cycle lanes and pavements, and more clutter and street furniture in pedestrian areas. Does the Minister agree with me that any alterations to our urban areas must ensure that it doesn't come at the expense of a disabled community and that true progress can only be made if we don't leave anyone behind? Minister. Um, thank you very much, President Officer, and I do uh, agree with uh, Mr Balfour. Um, and our ex accessible uh, travel framework uh, is there to help ensure more disabled people make successful door-to-door -door journeys more often. Uh, disabled people are, uh, we want to see disabled people more involved in the design, development and improvement of transport policies, services and infrastructure. Uh, and I know that in many places there is good practice uh, with d d disabled people being involved in the design uh, of new places and ensuring, as Mr Bal Balfour highlighted, that there are uh, the right amount of dis dis disabled parking spaces. Um, and the areas are truly accessible. Uh, and the government will continue uh, to listen to the voices of lived experience, disabled people themselves, in order to get that right as we move forward. Willie Rennie. Yeah, there's a lot of work to be done in this area. I recently joined disability campaigner Robert West for a tourist in Andrews, and we went through thoroughfare after thoroughfare, overcrossing, without any drop curbs in many locations, even next to disability parking bays there was no drop curbs. So this is a quarter of a century after the introduction of the Disability Discrimination Act. So what practical steps, I've heard what you said so far, but what practical steps can we take so we can see progress within the next few years? Minister. Um, thank you, President Officer, and uh, plaudits to uh, Mr Rennie for going out with his constituent to see exactly where the difficulties lie. I've done similar myself, particularly with uh, a blind constituent, to see the difficulties that they face. I think that what we require is for local authorities to ensure that they are taking due cognizance of the needs of the disabled people in their area. And I would hope that Fife Council uh, would listen to the likes of Mr Rennie's constituent in order that we get that right. And I think Mr Rennie points out a, a very good point around about um, uh, the lack of accessibility around about disabled parking spaces. You know, when these are being designed and planned for, uh, my expectation would be that local authorities, regional transport partnerships actually look at the whole area and not just the space themselves. Question number three, Christine Graham. Now, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met NHS Lothian and NHS Borders. Cabinet Secretary, uh, Minister, the Scottish Government you, officials uh, meet regularly with representatives of uh, all health boards, including, of course, NHS Borders uh, and Lothian. Indeed, I just met with the leadership of NHS Lothian uh, on Monday. Christine Graham. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware of a trial in, involving NHS Grampian local energy charity and an energy innovation hub where the board has identified 300 people at least requiring assistance with their energy bills because of their serious ill health requirements. I have a constituent at home with life support equipment whose monthly bill will rise on 1st December from £347 to £624 and to over £1,000 next year. Does the Cabinet Secretary consider other health boards should follow NHS uh, Grampian and consider such interventions. 
Cabinet Secretary. I, I do know uh, about the uh, important project, uh, pilot project that uh, Christian Graham highlights in relation to NHS uh, Grampian. Uh, I will make sure that that has been put on the radar of every single uh, health board uh, uh, chair and uh, chief executive. Uh, having spoken uh, to our chair and chief executives about this issue, and I know it has been raised by parliamentarians right across the chamber, we know just how important uh, any additional support can be during this very difficult uh, cost crisis. Uh, NHS Lothian and Borders do advise me that they have arrangements in place to help with energy cost support with some patients, uh, but I will uh, make sure that the pilot uh, that is referenced by Christine Graham uh, is put on their radar. Martin Whitfield. I'm very grateful, presiding officer. I'm glad the cabinet secretary met, met with um, NHS Lothian just on Monday, and he will have heard of the staffing challenges that are still keeping the Eddington Hospital closed. So, can the Cabinet Secretary say what specific help the Scottish Government have offered NHS Lothian with regard to their challenges with recruitment? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, significant uh, support has been given to all of our health boards, including NHS uh, Lothian. Uh, a lot of our concentration with NHS Lothian uh, has gone into the social care space. We know that delayed discharges are far too high, particularly in the city of Edinburgh, um, uh, and, and, and therefore we've been working extensively hard, asking people like, uh, you'll know, uh, Elma Murray, I'm sure, uh, who's provided some additional support, as well as, local, uh, as, well as national government support, uh, to both the health board and also to the health and social care partnership and indeed uh, the City of Council, uh, Edinburgh City uh, Council. So we're working really intensively. There has initially, it looks like, been some uh, positive movement in that regard in terms of the delayed discharges in Edinburgh City. We know if we can free up that capacity, uh, that then of course helps to free up uh, some of the, 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 the workload uh, and therefore uh, uh, hopefully in, in time will help to free up staff to be able to go back uh, into uh, other community assets such as the Eddington Hospital that he raises. Question number four, Neil Bibby. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met COSLA and what issues were discussed. Minister Ben McPherson. The Scottish Government engages regularly with COSLA at both official and ministerial levels uh, to discuss a wide range of issues as part of our shared commitment to working in partnership with local government to improve outcomes for the people and communities of Scotland. Other ministers have met with COSLA in recent days and weeks. Uh, I last met with COSLA on the 11th of October to discuss the child disability and adult disability payments, along with data sharing between Social Security Scotland and local government. Uh, I am also scheduled to meet with the pre presidential team in the coming weeks to discuss a wide range of issues, including the New Deal for local government. Neil Bibby. I thank the Minister for that answer. The failure to properly resource local councils has created protracted pay disputes all over the country, meaning refuge piling up on our streets and today school children being locked out of their classrooms. Our town halls are now facing even more tough decisions against the backdrop of rising costs, meaning cuts to public services in our communities. Does the Minister recognise that the Government's failure to provide any funding for pay settlements in the 21-22 local government settlement was the principal reason for the disputes this year? And will the government commit to properly fund councils in West Scotland in 22-23 so that they can make a fair pay offer for their hard-working employees struggling with a cost of living crisis and ensure people have the services they deserve? Minister. The, the Scottish Government, as I mentioned in my first answer, works in partnership with local government as two spheres of government equally committed to collaboration and serving the people of Scotland. The outcome of the resource spending review earlier this year means that despite the very challenging circumstances, we have provided local government revenue budget in cash terms with an extra £100 million being added. And the uh, £120 million added at stage two of the 22-23 Scottish Budget Bill um, has also been baselined in the local government settlement for future years. Uh, within the limited resources of the Scottish Government's uh, budget and the nature of the, the powers and flexibilities that the Scottish Government has, uh, the Scottish Government has consistently been committed to providing local government with as, as fair a settlement as, as is practical and reasonable, uh, as well as make, meeting all the other obligations that we have. And I would encourage uh, Mr Bibby to uh, engage with finance ministers in a spirit of collaboration, because the issues that are faced uh, across the country require it. 
Miles Briggs. Thank you, President Officer. The number of people who have died while homeless here in the capital has increased by nearly 150 per cent over the last four years. Shelter Scotland have said the situation points towards public services failing people and a broken housing system. It is simply not acceptable, and Edinburgh City Council do not have the resources to deliver a solution. So, as a fellow Ed Edinburgh MSP, can I ask the Minister a very simple question? Will he today now act and declare a homeless emergency here in the capital? Minister. Well, I, I, I appreciate the, the wide ranging nature of the question. Uh, of course, Mr. Uh, Briggs um, is obviously active in this space as a, as a Lothian MSP. I'm aware as a constituency MSP of the pressures on the housing market and the housing capacity here in the capital city, as is my colleague, the Cabinet Secretary Shona Robinson. There is strong commitment in the Scottish Government towards building more affordable housing. Of course, uh, over 112,000 uh, affordable homes built since 2007 across the country. Uh, action taken on short-term lets to increase the capacity in the city, uh, which of course the Conservatives did not support. So, the, an, an action on rents that was, were taken recently. So there is a multitude of action, including in trying to improve uh, provision for uh, homeless people in Scotland and a commitment to reduce homelessness. Uh, and we will continue with that work. And if uh, Mr Briggs has any constructive suggestions, he should uh, send them to the Cabinet Secretary. Question number five, Oliver Mundell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what urgent action it is taking to stabilise NHS dentistry services in Dumfries and Galloway. Minister Marie Todd. We understand that in certain remote and rural areas, such as Dumfries and Galloway, NHS dental access remains challenging. The service concerns experienced by the Board are driven by workforce and capacity issues with enhanced immigration controls and EU labour following Brexit, as well as care backlogs from the pandemic exacerbating historical difficulties. We have already put in place additional recruitment and retention incentives to maximise the opportunities for newly qualified dentists to work in areas such as Dumfries and Galloway and we continue to work with all health boards to deliver responsibility for NHS dental services in their area. It has to be said a record number of people are currently registered with an NHS dentist covering more than 95% of the population and across key treatments NHS dental services are at comparable levels of activity to levels last seen before the pandemic restrictions were introduced. Oliver Mundell. Challenging Minister, they are non-existent. Thornhill closed, Gretna closed, Castle Douglas closed. NHS dentistry is collapsing in the region. The Minister was warned this was the case on the 23rd of February during a Conservative-led debate in this Parliament. No meaningful additional action has taken place since. Does the Minister not feel even a tad of shame that in 2022, in SNP Scotland, your ability to see a dentist is based on your ability to pay? What will it take for this rotten government to end the decay? Minister. So let me be absolutely clear. Not one dental practice which was providing NHS dental services prior to the pandemic has closed due to financial failure. That's because of the level of support provided through the pandemic and in this post-pandemic recovery period, which totals over £150 million which we put in to maintain the capacity and capability of NHS dentistry. Officials are meeting with the board on a very regular basis and are in advanced discussion on how to maintain NHS capacity. For example, officials are exploring with the board the prospect of a comprehensive suite of Scottish Dental Access initiative grants across those areas where NHS dental provision has recently been lost. Now, those grants offer £100,000 to establishing a new surgery with £25,000 per additional surgery. I must say, though, historically, Briefly, Minister. this is an area where it has proven challenging for the Board to, do, to attract suitable, qualified dental professionals. Existential forces, such as the significant loss of EU workforce yeah, yeah. as a consequence of Brexit are invariably having a disproportionate impact in areas such as Dumfries and Minister, Galloway. Thank you. Emma Harper. 
Thank you, President Officer. Like Oliver Mundell, I have been contacted by many people across Dumfries and Galloway and other parts of the South of Scotland. I know it is really challenging and I know that there has been an impact exacerbated by Brexit. Can the Minister therefore provide an update on the Rural Visa Pilot Scheme in relation to dentists and will she agree to meet with me to discuss access to NHS dentistry in Dumfries and Galloway? Briefly, Minister. I thank the member for this consideration and I'd be happy to meet to discuss this issue. We've been particularly successful in growing the dental workforce in Scotland. It's increased by 32 per cent from 2007 to 2022, despite the challenging pandemic period. But with disruptions to the education and training of dentists and the real challenges of Brexit, we do face real difficulties. This situation is accentuated when you're dealing with regulated professions like dentistry. For example, overseas dentists are required to sit examinations with the General Dental Council before they're able to work as a dentist. We're pressing the GDC and the UK government to expand that capacity for examinations. Thank you. Question number six, Natalie Don. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how measures set out in the NHS recovery plan will support innovation and capacity in diagnostics for thrombosis. Cabinet Secretary <coughs> Hamza Youssef. Our, <coughs> excuse me, our NHS recovery plan is clear that innovation, the redesign of services and continually identifying new ways to increase our capacity are all integral to the recovery of NHS services. That includes increasing diagnostic capacity, including di diagnostics of thrombosis, and similar uh, artery and vein clotting conditions. Our specialist diagnostic services are split between imaging services such as MRI and CT scans, and to support delivery towards increasing capacity uh, by 78,000 uh, this year. We've secured seven mobile MRI and five mobile CT, CT scanners across Scotland, which is, of course, helping us to reduce weights. Natalie Dawn. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Symptoms of deep vein thrombosis include swelling, a throbbing pain in normally one leg and red or darkened skin around the painful area. And I know from one of my constituents' experience it can be extremely debilitating. Would the, Minister, eh, sorry, would the Cabinet Secretary therefore join me in emphasising the importance of raising the awareness of the symptoms of deep vein thrombosis? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, I'd be happy to, to, to do that. And uh, I think there may be more in this space that we can do around the communication of the symptoms and what people should be aware of of uh, when it comes to DVT and other artery and clot, uh, clotting uh, conditions. Uh, she'll know, of course, uh, particularly during the course of the pandemic, a lot of our public health messaging was focused towards COVID, understandably so, uh, but I, I think it's important as that has reduced uh, as, as, as we have moved into a different phase of this pandemic, uh, then we should look at what more we can do, particularly in the, space, uh, in the DVT space. Question number seven, Mercedes Vialba. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to address high private sector rents. Minister Patrick Harvey. The Cost of Living Tenant Protection Scotland Act, which came into force on the 28th of October, included a rent cap to protect tenants from high rent increases. At the same time, we are committed to introducing an effective national system of private sector rent controls by the end of 2025, and to do so in a way that is robust and provides lasting benefit to tenants. We're also providing up to £86 million in housing support this year, building on the £39 million of additional funding already provided to protect tenants as a result of the pandemic. Mercedes Vialba. I thank the Minister for his support for Labour's rent freeze policy. And it's vital that this stays in place until we have a national system of rent controls to bring rents down. Because long-term underinvestment in council housing and historic poor regulation of the private rental sector has allowed private landlords to cash in on the housing crisis while claiming that they provide a public service. But let's be clear, this isn't philanthropy, it's exploitation. So will the Minister commit to finally ending the two-tier system of rented housing in Scotland by capping private rents in line with social rental levels? Minister. Well, I'm glad that uh, the Labour Party supports the measures that the, the Scottish Government brought to Parliament, uh, measures that haven't been replicated by any other government in any other part uh, of the UK. The member is well aware, the member is well aware uh, that emergency legislation must by definition be temporary. It's ongoing necessity reviewed to ensure that the provisions remain proportionate 
to the situation, uh, and for that reason the, the measures will initially apply for a six-month period. But the Act also includes powers to extend the measures for two further six-month periods, subject to parliamentary approval, if circumstances show this to be necessary. And the Act also includes provisions to temporarily change the rent adjudication process, if this is necessary to support the transition away from the, the emergency measures, alongside the direct support that I have mentioned in my first answer and the Scottish Government's strong track record on providing social housing, this Government has the best track record of any part of the UK in supporting tenants in these difficult times.